I live in San Diego, California. I've lived in Southern California my entire life. I am uh, a sober coach. I call myself the midlife sobriety coach, and I help women who I say 35 and over really find that sweet spot with their relationship with them with themselves. And so they don't need alcohol. And I feel like that's such an important part to look at when we're looking at getting sober. It's what is the relationship with myself first? Because it has to yeah. start there. And I've been doing this work since 2018. And I am also the host of the 250 and Beyond podcast, which also debuted in 2018. And I got sober in 2013. So talk to us a little bit about your drinking story. I'll, I will put a link to the other episode in the show notes, but let's have the abbreviated version, please. <laughs> I started drinking in 1982 at 14. I started drinking because I was socially anxious. Uh, of course, everybody around me was drinking. Kids back then, when I grew up in high school, we would go to parties. There would always be alcohol. And I think back now, like, who was buying that alcohol? But there was always alcohol. And I went to a date party one night in 1982. That's where the girls invite the boys. I was um, part of a club and I had my first real drink, which was pink champagne. And before that, I had some sips with some friends when we were in junior high. But that first experience hooked me. It was, I'm not anxious anymore. I feel confident. I feel like I can be at the party and not worry about everything. I used to break out in hives on my neck whenever anybody would look at me the wrong way or talk to me. And so that started it. And throughout my drinking, uh, it took on different levels. And I think that we're going to get into that a little bit today from my teens to my 20s to my 30s. And then in my early 40s, when it really hit the dark side and I stopped drinking August 11th, 2013 at 45. Wow. Okay. Congratulations on your, your you. years of sobriety. They're stacking <laughs> up now, aren't they? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So today we're going to talk about signs that you need to take a break from alcohol, hoping that people are listening to this and thinking, oh yes, that one as well. Because both of us, I'm sure we had many red flags, didn't we? Many signs when we were drinking, but obviously one ignores those because you don't want to know. So it's, it's pretty difficult to take notice of them. Have you heard that statistic, uh, the 11 year statistic, as I called it? It was the tempest asking people in recovery, hundreds of people in recovery. How long was it between that moment that you knew you had a problem and the moment you reached out and actually did something about it? And the average was 11 years. Wow. I knew that she was doing that, but I don't think I've heard the results of that yeah, poll. Yeah. So 11 years. Yeah. Yes. I thought that was amazing and I thought, can it really be? But when I thought about my drinking, I tried to moderate for at least a decade because I couldn't imagine life without alcohol. So I think that was my 11 years. And that 11 year period is when people get the signs and the fact that we try to moderate and fail and try and fail. That's a big sign, isn't it? Because it's a sign that we can't imagine our life without alcohol, which means that we're dependent. So that that's a big sign. So let's let me kick off with the rules, because I had so many rules around my drinking. And one of my favorite ones that makes me smile when I look back is I decided I wouldn't have any alcohol in the house. I would only drink when we went out. But then practically every night I used to say to my husband, oh, there's a new restaurant over there. Why don't we go and check it out? Or let's have some people around. There would always be an excuse. So that was one of my rules. Give me one of yours. Absolutely. And I want to go back to the 11 years yeah. <laughs> because I think that's such a good point to make because there's so many people out there who are walking around with us and they're beating themselves up thinking this has been a really long time for me. That was not my experience. I really went along with everybody drinks. Alcohol is okay. It is what I do. I had that first hit two years before I stopped drinking. Someone in my family had used the term alcoholic toward me 
a little bit broader, but I took it very personally. And I thought, let me prove him wrong. And let me prove to myself that is not true. That was that first hit. And so it was about two years before I stopped drinking. And yes, I went into, I could say it verbatim, only drink on Saturday, only drink red wine, not white wine or champagne. Because the minute that hits, there's no way I'm going to moderate. Red wine wasn't my thing. I had all of those rules and more so than not, I broke them over and over again. Yeah. 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 And every time we break our rules, we feel bad, don't we? I, I remember all my years of trying to moderate and failing. My self-esteem was on the floor. I used to think, what's wrong with me? I've got no willpower. Now, of course, I understand it's all about mindset. It's nothing to do with willpower, but I used to think I've got no willpower. It was as if it was a, a personality characteristic that I was lacking. And I thought, look at everybody else. They can drink normally. Why can't I? It's quite we a never dark know. place. Yes, we never know what anybody is going through with their drinking unless they're telling us. And once you get in that cycle, that vortex of drinking alcohol, it's going to keep knocking you down. If it's on the table even in moderation, if it's there and you know yourself, that's where it comes back to that relationship we have with ourselves and knowing our personality, because that's what ultimately led me to quit drinking. I knew I don't want just one. I don't want just red wine. I don't want just one sip. I want more. And uh, once we pay attention to that voice, we can start the process of changing it. But yeah, it, it will continue knocking you down if it's in the picture and you know yourself yeah. and you know that's not how I want to yeah. drink. Yeah. Once we discover we don't have an off switch. <laughs> it's just <laughs> continually going to be on until we take control and turn it off. And everybody is capable of doing that. But yes, it's that really low that we get in. And when you talk about rock bottoms, it's a personal rock bottom. When you're in that mode of, I can't even look in the mirror at myself anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm so down on myself. I just can't get this. Why is it? It's just introducing any little bit of alcohol to somebody who really doesn't want a little bit is where it starts. Yeah, it's like torture, isn't it? I remember reading about the low risk limits uh, in the UK, the, a bottle and a half of wine a week. And if I could only drink, that would be a torture for me, really, because I used to drink for the buzz. One and a half bottles a week, it means a small glass maybe every other night. What's the point of that? <laughs> Yeah, when you look at deprivation, we all think we're going to be so deprived because we stopped drinking. But think of the deprivation that goes along with moderation for somebody yes. who doesn't want. That's what it's all about. Yeah. A bottle and a half of wine a week. What's the point? What's the point? <laughs> so my attitude was, if that's all I can have, then I won't have any. And then it's about learning how to live with not having any and how to love yourself again and how to be happy. And it's a process. Sleeping patterns. I used to have 3 a.m. wake up call, just racked with anxiety and thinking, oh God, what did I say? What happened? I used to look around my bedroom, always checking that my jacket and my handbag was there because I, I always used to think that I'd left everything. <laughs> and I, I usually had it because I would go on automatic pilot. It's, it's so weird the way our brains work when we're in that state, isn't it? So, yeah, oh, sleep. Absolutely. Wake up calls. Yeah, what sleep. Your... I've never been that great of a sleeper even now, but definitely when I was drinking and yes, I would wake up in a panic. I I to, I've told this story before, but I woke up one time after drinking so heavily, my heart was racing. I woke up and I just sat up in bed and I said, oh my gosh, I convinced myself that my husband and I hadn't filed our taxes like five years before that, for some reason, like we hadn't filed our taxes. I got up and I went through the file cabinets. I went through our paperwork. That's how I would get, I would get so panicked and I would talk myself into things. But yes, in my twenties, it was always a thing. And it was a joke at the time with my friends. I would never have not know where my wallet was or my purse or anything the next day. I would wake up or my wallet would be like the dollar bills would be all over the place because I would get home and like, how much money did I spend? Because back then I didn't have a lot of money and I was out drinking. I was like, how much money did I spend? And I was just like, oh my gosh, yes, all of that. But when I got into that two year questioning period, I was going through perimenopause. And so I was 
highly anxious even more so than normal and then i was drinking and so my sleep was almost nil at that time there was not a lot of it going on and i did realize during that time yeah, this is making me feel even worse. So that's when that light bulb, that plant, that seed gets planted, let's say, and you start thinking about it, it, it starts growing and growing. Sleep was a big one for me to realize. Yeah. yeah. I think when we switch from using alcohol to socialize and have fun, and then slowly some of us switch to using alcohol as a coping mechanism, because I was quite a party person in my 20s and 30s. And then I was married with a child and a job and juggling everything. So my drinking was more about coming home, opening a bottle of wine and just feeling this is my reward for everything that I do for keeping this show on the road and working my way through it. So there was nothing social about it in the end. Yeah, and it was the reward. Yeah. I deserve it. I need it. In my early 40s, I lost my mom. And so after that period, I was 42. So I went into three years of really just checking out completely. And even though my drinking was very consistent and I could drink a lot, it picked up even heavier during that time. And again, I didn't know I was going through perimenopause. I was going to the doctor. I was scared. I was having all kinds of different things happening. And I figured it out. That's what it was. And I realized that the alcohol is making everything worse. I hadn't even really grieved the loss of my mom because I was covering it all up with drinking. But yeah, I was very much checked out during that time and using alcohol as a crutch, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We use it for so many things. And I think another giveaway is, and a lot of women are like this, I know plenty of them, and I was certainly like that. We're into the wellness thing. We eat organic and we exercise and we do yoga and we do aqua aerobics. We do everything basically to be healthy and we eat gl gluten-free, everything you can think of, yet we're still drinking. I was doing all that, but I had to have my bottle of wine a night and I think my attitude was, I work so hard and I'm, I'm very healthy. I need this. Don't take my wine away. <laughs> exactly. That's what we're doing. It was, that was what I was doing for most of my life. So I thought, I don't think it's our fault because we grew up with drinking. Everybody was drinking. It's okay. Unless you get that hit and you go, oh my gosh, alcohol isn't good for me anymore because you're listening to Tribe Sober, or you're listening to something, you see something online. A lot of people, it's not our fault. We're walking around with the idea that alcohol is self-care. Yeah. I deserve it. It's the way I unwind. Until we start to get those little nuggets, just those little signs, and we hear other people talking about it, then we can pull ourselves out of it. There wasn't a lot of people talking about this back when I was researching no. and getting sober i was asking google dr google one question am i an alcoholic i wanted to know like what it what is the difference between me being somebody who parties and handles life i've always worked i've been a hard worker i was starting a business at that time what is it and yeah i wasn't googling is alcohol harmful to me that came later but yeah i want anybody to realize that because we all just walk around thinking we should know all this stuff <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's never too late to yeah. learn Absolutely. And I always say that if we don't educate ourselves about alcohol, then big alcohol will educate us and they just tell us it's wonderful and we have to drink more. They're we've got all too... the marketing. Yeah. Um, they're... We've got the movies. Every time you watch a movie on Netflix, I time it now, five minutes and the alcohol's out. It's either a glamorous lady with a big glass of wine or it's some kind of gangster with his glass of scotch. Always there so I mean, subliminally, we think, oh, those people are role modeling alcohol for us. It's not the people who are using alcohol to cope with life. That's not who they're marketing to. They're not using the marketing in their advertisements because if they had slapped a photo of me up there, yeah. it would be on the bathroom floor crying, not knowing why I was crying, saying mean things to my husband, lashing out at good friends. It That was me. And I thought it was really romantic and classy. And that's why I just love the champagne. Like, this is classy. Yeah. Started out with the pink champagne and it progressed. Yeah, we've got this idea. And I just want us all to acknowledge the fact that it's not 
your fault if you have not realized this or you have not realized that going alcohol free and getting sober is an option. Yeah. And I think so many people, me included, imagine that that life would be very dull and dark and, and boring without alcohol. In the end, I had to give up for health reasons. But I was very depressed about it. And I thought, my life's over, basically. But I used to say things like, I'm quite old now. And I suppose I had lots of great times. And now I'm just going to stay home and read books. <laughs> but in fact, my life has opened up enormously. And people don't realize that. And I think that's one of the wonderful surprises. A, we learn to love ourselves again after all those years of beating ourselves up. And B, life opens up because the life of an alcoholic is very narrow an alcoholic will become more and more isolated i used to love drinking alone because i thought there's nobody here to judge me that just carries on so when you do stop you start enjoying everyday pleasures again the things that don't involve alcohol so we say to people actually when they join tribe sober we say be excited because we can tell that some of them are they've hit a rock bottom recently or they've been planning to do this for ages now they've finally done it but you can tell they don't look happy <laughs> sometimes we'll have a zoom meeting and there's so many sad faces so we say be excited please be excited because this is a life-changing journey so it's getting that mindset isn't it unplugging from the matrix of conditioning we're conditioned to drink they've played Definitely. us especially women Definitely. And I felt so flat in the beginning. That's the only way I can describe it. It was just flat. There was a lot of resentment towards just, yeah, people on TV who could drink, resentment towards people I knew that could drink, resentment towards myself for not being able to handle my drinking. There was a lot of grieving going on, of course, for my mom at the time. And then also my former self, you know, that person that, yes, like you were saying, like I always thought, and I had that identity that I gave myself yeah. party girl, good time, Lori. That's what I was known for from the age of 14 on up. I, I could rally, I could be there, we could drink, everything revolved around it. And I missed that person. And sometimes I still do after 10 years of sobriety, I miss that person. But when I look at her, I just want to give her a big hug. I really want to give her a big hug. And I believe she was doing her best. She thought that she was doing her best. And you just don't know. Everybody has a different experience with this until you get out of that vortex, until you get out of the one option of drinking and open yourself up to more options like going alcohol free. I do believe that you can open so many different doors that you never thought would open in your life. I would never be here with you. You would never be here with me. Just podcasting, <laughs> for example, it's, it's such a fabulous experience for both of us. We've both met so many interesting people, haven't we, podcasting. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it's fantastic. I want to say, too, because I know that you talk to a lot of our older generation as well as the younger ones as well. When we get to this age, we start questioning everything in life. We start asking ourselves questions, just like different relationships. Yeah. Is, is this relationship serving me anymore? Is this activity serving me anymore? It gets down to that point. And I believe that's why so many people in the middle of life and beyond are really questioning their relationship with alcohol and setting up to the fact that, hey, other people are going alcohol free. It doesn't have to be a rock bottom. You don't have to put a label on it. It is an option for me. And I think that comes with just that superpower of being older and then also removing alcohol from your life because it is something that you think, I can't live without, I can't do it. But think of all the confidence you're building in yourself and the opportunities you're giving yourself that you may never have experienced if you kept drinking. I think that those two things, aging and sobriety, are something that is just completely life-changing, but also so empowering. <laughs> yeah, it's a superpower, isn't it, the sobriety? And, mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people get stuck in life because they're drinking, because you can be in a relationship that's not right for you, in a job that's not right for you, but you go through the motions and then you drink and, and you're numbing it all the way.
we have a lot of members that have got sober and then they've got divorced but happily because they've just realized they're not with the right person or they've left their job big decisions we've had quite a few that have changed countries they've moved overseas so life changing it really is life changing yeah so, i believe so too let's go back to our starting <laughs> i'm going off on a rant as usual <laughs> So we talked about coping mechanisms and doing all the things, didn't we? Never having an off switch. Oh, here's a funny one. What about bruises? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can't remember the bruises in my 40s, but definitely in my 20s. I had some really scary things happen to me in my 20s. In my 30s, yeah. Yeah, I did some really silly stuff when I was drinking. I will say that. I did some really silly stuff and I would wake up the next day and I would be sore. I used to do the splits and I was doing <laughs> like the splits. No, not, especially in my forties, I was not in that place where I was able to be doing splits, but I would still do them while I was drinking. I wake up the next day, like barely could walk, but yes, I get that. Did yeah, you have a lot yeah. of bruises? Yeah. Even as I got older, actually, because you bruise more easily when you get older. And yeah, I mentioned it, didn't I, in my notes, we used to call it UDIs, unidentified drinking incidents. That's it, isn't it? When you're young, certainly you get in this vibe where you all laugh about what you did last night. That Laurie, she did the splits again and <laughs> Janet crashed into something and she's covered in bruises. And it's funny. I think I told you on one of our conversations, but when I was 25 years old, I nearly drowned in my bath because I had an alcoholic blackout. I and do I remember back, that. The risks that we took, it's a miracle that we're here, really. It, it really is. Nice. So I think drinking alone is a red flag as well. Yes, I wrote down hangovers that last two or three days. That was definitely a sign for me because I did mention that I was somebody who could rally very easily. And I was starting to get to the point in my early 40s where I was actually getting sick. And when I was in that questioning mode of two years, I remember thinking at that point, you have been getting sick you have been actually getting sick. And that was never something that I would ever do. That was one of those red flags I remember thinking like, oh, okay, <laughs> I probably saw it on a list somewhere. When I laugh about this or joke, it's not funny, but you know what, I'm going back to myself back then and I've had so much experience when I first stopped drinking to now, but it's not funny. And so when I go back to myself then, she was so scared and she was in such a dark place. And that was one of those things I honestly recall, there must have been some sort of checklist or something. Do the quiz or whatever it is, are you an yeah. alcoholic? Do you get sick? Or, and that was something that I thought, oh boy, that is starting. Yeah, yeah. I think society doesn't do us any favors really by stigmatizing the alcoholic. Because when I was drinking, I would see an old man in the park on the bench with his bottle and think, oh, shame. And then think, I'm not like him. I don't have a problem to that extent. So you can delude yourself, really, because I think if you could really do a study and get the proper numbers, I think 90% of alcoholics are probably highly functioning and they look great and they've got good jobs and you'd never dream that they had a problem. But the trouble with living like that is, apart from the fact that you're damaging your health on a daily basis, the problem is it takes so much energy to keep the show on the road as a functioning alcoholic that there's no real energy left for yourself. It takes everything. And that's the joy of being sober, because suddenly you feel full of energy and ideas and life, and you want to try new things for the first time in years. Sure. When you're working so hard to keep drinking going and you're constantly in that cycle, you wake up in the morning and you say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to drink tonight. I cannot do it. And then by the end of the day, you're drinking because you feel so bad and you're telling yourself just one more night, just one more drink, whatever it is. It's really hard to get out of that and to see the other side of it. I was not getting the same buzz. I call it chasing the buzz. I was chasing it and I could be like a bottle in and realize it's still not happening. Yeah, it's still yeah. not there. I'm not getting those happy feelings. It's not the good endorphins. It's not that hit. It was more of, oh my gosh, now I've got to open a second bottle. 
it yeah. just stops working basically doesn't mm -hmm. it i guess mm -hmm. that is such a, a sign isn't it if alcohol's not working for you if it's not even giving you a buzz what is the point all you're doing is drinking poison damaging your body for nothing it's a really great sign if you are questioning it you're justifying it you are thinking i'm not that bad yet because that's the vision what you described the man in the park with a bottle laying on the the park bench on the paper bag that's the vision that i had and it does hold so many people back including myself it's not that bad yet i feel like that's a really good sign if you're telling yourself it's not that bad yet i am not like the guy who wants to be like the guy in the park exactly. with the paper bag in a bottle no don't get yourself there be honest with yourself and say i don't have to be that bad yet yeah yeah, it's a spectrum. That's not it? what I'm. Well, that's not the direction that I want to go in. I'm not waiting until I hit the worst point of my life. I want to prevent myself from getting there. Yeah, because there might be no coming back from that place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point, Laurie. When we start thinking about it, even if we just think, "Oh, I had a bit much last night," and we start feeling bad about it. It, it shouldn't really be on our minds. I do know quite a lot of normal drinkers are married to one and alcohol isn't even on their radar. They don't think about it. They don't go to a restaurant and start engaging with the wine waiter and watch everyone else's glass and worry, will there be enough wine for everybody? It's just not on their radar. Sometimes people will come to me and they'll say, I want you to teach me to moderate. I would say, I can't, because if you can moderate, you'll moderate. You won't come to Tribe Sober and uh, I can teach you the toolkit that we give people who are stopping and you can try that. But if you can moderate, you moderate. You, you can't learn how to do that. Once we've crossed a line into dependence, that's it. We have to stop and then we have to build a life that we don't want to escape from. And those first few months are tricky. How long was it for you, Laurie, until you started relaxing into your sobriety and, and finding yourself again? After that first year, Mark, that one year, I have blown my mind here. <laughs> the fact that I did this after 30 years of drinking, I felt a charge definitely at that mark. I will be very honest. I was going back and forth that entire first year. Should I drink? Should I not drink? I was still doing all the trying, but it started to ease up a little bit because I really started to write in my journal, yay you, like I'm proud of you. I would write those yeah. notes to myself and that just trumps anything. When you are a 45, 46 year old woman and you're finally experiencing being proud of yourself and building that confidence that you really used to drink to get, that was life changing for me. So about that year mark, I really felt, okay, what's next? What yeah. is this next level I want to take it to? Yeah. And it is the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? it we just feel better and better as, as time goes on. Our bodies and brains are so amazing the way that they recalibrate and heal after everything we did to them. I always say sobriety didn't fix me. It helped me to realize I didn't need fixing. I'm human. And my goodness, we all make poor choices in life. I, I still make poor choices. I, I don't drink, but I still make poor choices for myself. I'm not always aligned to what I value and the things that I'm working towards. That's being human. We all realize that there are things in life that I, I can never control drinking. I would never be able to moderate my drinking. And I used to be really shameful of that. And now it's just, it's my truth. And there are so many different human beings out there in the world who are in the same boat and we're all in it together. We're all rowing and learning more as we go. But yeah, I just feel like we got to give ourselves a break. Yeah. Yeah. And we Literally. To love ourselves again and we're kinder to ourselves, aren't we? Mm -hmm. The feelings thing. I'm a big fan of Glennon Doyle. I don't know if you read her stuff, but mm -hmm. she said, the other day she said we're not here to be happy we're here to feel all the feelings and i love that because i think it takes the pressure off sometimes there's too much pressure isn't there that oh we've got to be happy every day and if we're not happy something's wrong i like that and in my early sobriety i was fine for about three months 
because I was so excited. I thought, oh, wow, I've finally done this thing. And it's not that hard. But then when I got to about three months, my mood plummeted big time. And I thought, oh, God, can I really do this? You've, you've just said you were going back and forth. That was my back and forth. But I felt with my health issue, I just couldn't. So I stuck it out. I just waited and read books and hoped that things would get better. And after another few months of quite a low mood, things did get better. But only when I had my idea to start Tribe Sober. So I say to people now, in early sobriety, think of a project, something that you can really get into and will engage you and stop you thinking about how you want to drink because we have to find something else. Absolutely. And that's healthy to do that. I've had women say to me, I just feel like I'm constantly distracting myself if I'm doing something else. It's not looking at it as a distraction, set in it, be in it. Because you're right. What Glenn Doyle says, if we're constantly chasing happiness, we're never going to be satisfied in life. It's never going to be enough. And when I learned the term, you can be both end, it's like you could be both happy and sad. That was life-changing to me. And I learned that probably in my early fifties. <laughs> you don't have to be one way or another. You can sit in it and you can experience these feelings. You're going to be okay. But then also you have another option. If it's too much, you can get up, you could do anything. You could start a craft project. You could start a blog where you write about it and you keep it anonymous. You could start an Instagram like I did two years later. Like I want to talk about this publicly now I'm ready. You can do all kinds of different things and it's okay to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We need and, that. And absolutely. And journaling's fantastic. Yeah. I interviewed a neuroscientist a while ago and she explained to me that she believes that happiness is a learned skill because our brains haven't changed since we were in our caves. So we're wired to survive. We're not wired to be happy. So we're wired to look out for danger, which means that we're slightly anxious and very observant all the time. She reckons that if you want to be happy, you can have happiness in short bursts, if you like, but you have to trigger the neurochemicals that make us happy. So I thought that was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And accept that happiness and sadness will pass. We're not going to be happy all the time or sad all the time. And sometimes if I get miserable for a day, I think I'll feel better again in a couple of days. Whereas I used to just dive in the booze. I'd say, oh, let's open a bottle of bubbly. That'll perk me up. <laughs> Same. I, I say to myself all the time, Lori, it's a bad day. It's a bad afternoon. It's not a bad life. It's not a bad year. It's not a bad week. It's not. It's just that's it. And then I always can go back to... I know because I have the track record that we all ebb and flow. Some days aren't that great. Other days are better. Depends on my sleep always. <laughs> but there's no reason to drink over something like that. And I'm saying that to myself because that's what I used to do. Oh my gosh, such a bad day. It was a bad week. I'm so stressed. I deserve it. I need it. Like all of that. Yeah, not worth it. All right. Or I'm really happy today. Let's have a drink to celebrate. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> you could cheers with diet coke and water <laughs> did uh, anybody used to say anything about your drinking your partner or your friends did they tell you drank too much no in fact i heard the opposite you're okay you don't have to oh. quit from friends from my husband until about 90 days in because bill and i we've been together we're going on 27 years in february and we met in a bar we drank a lot together and when I said to him, you know, I don't think I can keep drinking. And this was, you know, in that two year period. And then I said to friends, I think I got to st stop drinking. All of them said, no, you don't. You're okay. You don't. And then about 90 days in, Bill and I sat down. I'll never forget it. He just looked at me and goes, because he quit too with me. He oh. drinks occasionally now, but he's not a drinker anymore. He said, you can never go back because he saw the difference. And that's why you can't see it when you're still drinking. I and mean, I know we want to try and we want to make it work, right? We want to do all the things like you talked about. I started to get into exercising again right before I stopped drinking, thinking I'll exercise more, I'll diet more, I'll do all these things and slap some face creams on me to not make me look like I'm aging rapidly. All of that 
but it was the bottle in the middle of the circle that was still there that I was circling around. And so when you get out of it, you can actually feel and see and yeah, see that different perspective. Yeah. Oh, that's a lovely story that he stopped with you and then he told you he wanted you to continue the journey. That's, yeah, uh, he's a good I, guy. I, I feel sorry for people that are married to heavy drinkers and they have all this crap to put up with. Oh, you're no fun anymore. And why don't you stop drinking? It must be so hard. I do too. And what you said in the beginning, I actually wrote it down for a podcast topic. I would love for somebody to come on and talk about this. The fact that a lot of people separate or get divorced after they get sober. It's such an important topic to talk about. And I always say this, and I know it's so hard, but nobody is worth drinking because of nobody is worth it. Yeah, absolutely. It's hard. No, we find out, and especially as we get older, this is important. We connect with who we really are and we discover what we really want to do with the rest of our lives because it messes with your mind. It really does. And that's why it's, it is hard those first few months, but then when you get out of the vortex, as you called it, life is so different. And I think a lot of people that are worried about stopping, they don't realize that they think their life is going to be the same without drinking, but it's not the same, is it? It's really different. You got to give yourself time though to experience that. Cause if you're saying that after seven days or even seven months, everybody has a different timeline here. Just say to yourself, I'm not there yet. No, and I'm going no. to keep going because going back is going to take you back to how you feel about yourself Yeah. yeah. when you're drinking. It's different. You got to give yourself yeah. the opportunity to accept that and to, and to start to pay attention to that because we can pay attention to it's not fixing anything or we can pay attention to, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful. I had a better night's sleep last night. I look better. I have got the glow up going on. People are noticing I'm more positive. I'm not so reactive. I pause and I say nice things to myself. All of those are wins. If we're able to get ourselves to the place of, I'm going to let myself give myself that permission slip to acknowledge these things instead of acknowledging all that alcohol did for me and all the things that I'm missing out on. We can flip it around. It it definitely is mindset. Yeah. I think that we gain so much more than we lose when we quit drinking. What do we lose really once we're out of it? We lose hangovers, blackouts, depression, extra weight, (laughs) and we gain health, happiness, look better, feel better so much. So you really can turn it around. Yeah. It takes time. And it is challenging. Yeah. And pe- a lot of people are impatient. Yeah, you know, They say to me after a couple of weeks, I haven't had a drink for two weeks and I still feel rubbish. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so, I, so, I, I usually say to them, how long were you drinking for? And they'll say, 30 years. <laughs> That was me Um, with the not drinking and then also dieting. I used to be like, oh my gosh, it's only, it's been 14 days since I started this diet and I haven't lost 20 pounds yet. Oh, I'm going to just go back. I had that mindset for most of my life. You got to be patient. You never know what's around the corner the next day or the next week. And that's where you can get really excited. Yeah. Yeah. I interviewed a, a doctor who works in a rehab and she told me that they have a rule of thumb there that for every year that you drank, you need a month of recovery. So I thought that was very interesting because I drank for 40 years and my recovery took three and a half years. <laughs> wow. I like so, that. Yeah. I think people You tell need... most people that, and especially because most of us are, we want that quick fix. That's why we drink, right? We want that quick fix. I've had several conversations with women. How long is this going to take? How long is it going to take till I stop thinking about drinking, because that's the number one thing. And I think that's a, yeah, we've talked about that side. If you're constantly thinking about it, especially when you're not drinking, that is definitely a sign. It's like, I can't give you a real timeline there, but I feel like if you are going to progress forward every day, you take it on a day-to-day basis, you're going to be able to answer that question probably sooner than you think. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I mean, but it's are, overwhelming. Are different. I never know whether to give that timeline that the rehab doctor <laughs> gave me to new people. I just think of my personality. If somebody was to give me a timeline and I wasn't hitting all the benchmarks, I would think either, oh, it's not working for me. I would pinpoint it. It's my fault. It's my problem. Like when I was pregnant, I read the book. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, what to expect when you're expecting. And I drove my mom crazy because I would always tell her, oh my gosh, this is coming up. This is coming up. She's Lori, put that book down. And I was so stressed about it. Certain things didn't happen. I think most of the stuff didn't happen, but it was just like, it was always there hovering. I, I got to have my own experience with things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think patience is everything. And I think what you said about that year, and when I think about my experience, if you can get through a year, things will change, but things change at different rates. We have people that join and they just stop drinking and they feel fabulous and they carry on like that. But most people, they have their ups and they have their downs. And we have a diagram that we use, which we call the recovery curve. And I don't if you've seen it, it's a little bit like the bereavement curve. You're in denial, anger, and then you go up and then you go down and finally bump along the the bottom and it's acceptance. And I think that's good for people just to get mm -hmm. a perspective and to realize that because they feel miserable for a couple of days, it doesn't mean that they need to start drinking again. They just need to sit with the feelings, feel the feelings. Yeah. I think another red flag that I certainly had was if most of your social activities involve drinking, because I, I remember when I was a drinker, if someone invited me to something and there wasn't going to be alcohol there, I wouldn't quite get it. I would find an excuse. My life was set up because my friends were drinkers, our social things were drinkers. And I wondered if you were like that. Oh, absolutely. Because I was and still am socially anxious. However, now I can be in a place and I actually really appreciate being somewhere without drinking. But oh my goodness, like I remember in my 20s, my friends started having babies and in my 30s, like baby showers back then didn't have alcohol. I think they do today. <laughs> but it was like, oh my gosh, it, they just thought I was a flake. I would have to cancel last minute because if I was going someplace and it didn't have alcohol, work events, things like that, like dinners and stuff. There was stuff that we would have in our office. There was alcohol there, but you couldn't drink because you were putting it on. It would terrify me. And I would have to either cancel at the last minute, make an excuse or something, or just say, no, I, I can't do that. But Definitely everything. My kids, my son's birthday parties, Christmas, everything like that. It's not my proudest mom moment for sure when I think back on those things, but everything revolved around alcohol being there. Yeah. 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 I remember the mommy juice phase. My son would have his little friends around and they'd be on a sugar high running around the room and all the mommies would be on the bubbly. Yeah, another one is when you're checking out at the supermarket, the liquor store, and you've got quite a few bottles there, and you make a joke of it with the cashier. You say, oh, I'm having a party at the weekend, as, as if she cares. I think that's quite a, a giveaway as well, because you shouldn't have to feel uncomfortable or justify yourself to the cashier. Definitely. I've heard that story. But again, for such a long time, I just thought that's what everybody did. I actually took pride in my drinking, honestly. And so I feel like I've heard so many people talk about that. I think Casey Davidson talks about this, her recycling bin, carrying the bottles out, that kind of stuff. Yeah. If you're feeling that kind of embarrassment and shame from something like that, definitely a sign. Look at that. I used to have a mental picture of how much wine I had in the house, how much wine I had at home. I could tell you, for example, how many bottles of wine I had in the fridge or in the cupboard or wherever else they were, because I was always concerned about having enough wine. I didn't want to have to go out in the evening and get some more. Did you used to stock up nicely? I didn't stock up towards the end because I didn't want to have it in the house. Again, the rules, that was oh, yes. a total rule. So I would, it would be one drinking event at a time. And my husband would always go to the store if I didn't have it. But definitely it was very strategic. I always had one bottle of champagne, two bottles of Chardonnay. The, like that would, that was it. Towards the end, 
I wanted to, so I would leave sometimes literally maybe less than a glass in the second bottle so I could get up in the morning and look at it and go, oh, okay, you didn't drink that. You did good. That's where I was. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't every night though. I, I want to say that towards the end, I could barely function. Honestly, I was going through perimenopause. I felt horrible. So I was drinking Friday, Saturday, and Sunday all day. Sunday was my drink. I had the Sunday scaries. That was my drinking day. And I would drink, and that was the toughest day for me after I stopped drinking to get through. It was very strategic towards the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do get strategic <laughs> in restaurants. I, I always had my eye on everybody else's glass. Oh, yeah. and, uh... I want to make sure I get enough. Don't drink too much <laughs> of my stuff. And then during the week, I will say, even if I was doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday drinking, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I was hungover and thinking about my next drink. So it's yeah, always consuming yeah. <laughs> the yeah, brain. Yeah. And that is one of the big joys of sobriety and even early sobriety is when you don't have to think about it anymore because it takes up so much mental space. And it's crazy because there's so many more interesting things to think about. So many more. Yeah. So any more red flags or any more warning signs you can think of, Laurie, or have we exhausted our memories? There's probably more. Well, yeah, there's so many signs. And I know somebody who's listening right now, they know. I think it's a heart and soul matter, what we feel in our heart and soul, what we feel and maybe our gut that pull. And like I said earlier, getting older and starting to question other things in your life and really honing in on this relationship with alcohol. And then also looking at, gosh, I really value a good night's sleep. I feel like a whole brand new person the next day and alcohol really takes that away from me. Or I really value being productive. And after drinking, I'm just noticing that I'm feeling worse and worse and I can't get anything done the next day. For those of us who work a nine to five or those of us who have their own business, there are some days where I feel like, oh boy, after a horrible night's sleep, I'm not that focused. I can't get that much stuff done. So if I threw alcohol in the mix, <laughs> it would be days off. So if you have that pull and your heart and soul is telling you, this doesn't feel right anymore. Because towards the end of my drinking, I would write in my journal when I started journaling, this is a really bad habit. It was more than that, but this is a really bad habit. You don't want to drink, but you're drinking. Yeah, It's because it's something that I've always done. That was part of my identity. Yeah. It was part of who I was. And when I stopped drinking, I felt literally I had lost a limb because it was such a big part of me and it felt so awkward for anybody out there, no matter what your age is, if you have that pull and your heart and soul is telling you that this is not right for me anymore. I'm not doing the things that I want to do with my life. That's a sign. And you could do something about it. Yeah. Because we know in our hearts, don't we, that we're drinking too much. I knew for years and years. But in fact, I didn't know how to stop drinking because I, I did try AA, but that didn't work. So I just needed the right community, the right people. And, and then I could do it. But I, I was stuck for a long time because uh, I didn't know how to do it. And you talked about being strategic. Yeah, I was thinking about my diary. I was working. I was one of those high-functioning alcoholics with a good job. And I would look at my diary for the week ahead, and I would have a couple of business lunches, which would involve alcohol. And I would make sure that the afternoon was very light, so that I had nothing too taxing to do in the afternoon, because I knew I wouldn't be on my game. That's I would do that for an entire Monday. <laughs> Mondays, <laughs> I can't do anything. It's basically, I'm living like four or three days a week now. Yeah. 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 I can't do anything on Monday. I'm going to be hungover. Yep. Yeah. And certainly with aging, I think you were talked about expensive face creams, didn't you, earlier? I think for all the money that women spend on cosmetics, etc., I think if you just quit drinking, it's the best thing that you can do as you get older for your health, your happiness, and your looks. So it's a bit of a no-brainer as we get older. And certainly with the menopause, at least I drank my way through mine. But at least if you're not drinking and you've got menopause, you can really understand what's going on because otherwise it all gets mixed up, doesn't it? Of course, you've got a foggy brain and you're feeling tired because you're hungover. 
Absolutely. I wanted to blame everything on perimenopause. And what I learned was a lot of it was to do with alcohol. But again, you don't see that perspective until you're out of it. And then you realize, oh, okay, it might have been the alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I hope some people are listening to this and thinking, yeah, I get those signs. Maybe I should try. I would say to people, when we record this, we're coming up to the end of 2023. So why not try an alcohol-free year? Because you can always go back to drinking at the end of the year. <laughs> That's what I always say. Alcohol is always going to be there. Yeah, You yeah. can go back if it doesn't work for you because we have to offer ourselves flexibility and the fact that I don't know if this is going to work for me. Even if you've tried it several times before, I don't know if this time it's going to work for me. And we yeah. got to loosen the reins a little bit and give ourselves, like I said, a little bit of a break. And yes, ease into it. And I always talk about this. The one thing that helped me the most in getting sober, because I was like you, Janet, I had no idea how to do it. <laughs> and the, the beauty of 2024 is the fact that podcasts exist. Tribe Sober community is out there. I have a community. I coach. People are talking about it on social media. There's so many different ways to go about this because when I stopped drinking, that was my biggest fear. I will not go and stand up in a room and say I am an alcoholic to anybody. And I love that people use AA. It helps so many people. I have friends. I have family that it's helped so much. But for me and my personality, that wasn't going to work. So instead of holding off thinking, I'm going to make it better on my own. I started reading books. I read my first book, Drinking a Love Story by Caroline Knapp at that yeah. time. That was so helpful to me. I started listening to Eminem because I knew that he was in recovery. And I thought if Eminem can do it, I can do it. I was seeking out my own mentors, but now you can seek them out so much better and, and easier. But I would say the one thing it was just, I went all in. There was no plan B. I went all in because I knew my personality didn't want a little bit. I knew that my drinking was going to escalate. I didn't want to be 30 years down the road if I was that lucky to live that long and be in the same boat. And so I went all in. I took it completely off the table. And it's not easy to do. You don't need it to be easy. But if you're tired of the back and forth, it's got to be that mindset. I don't drink anymore versus I'm trying not to drink anymore yeah 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 we had a lady at a meeting the other day and she's about six months sober and there were some new people there and she said i've learned that the way to get through those first few months is to obsess about sobriety almost make it a full-time job and do everything you can absolutely it has to be a priority because if it's not and you're not there yet that's okay too yeah. i do believe that timing it is a part of it but if you're not there yet, beating yourself up isn't going to get you there any sooner. But if you're not to that point where it is going to be a priority, if you show up to coaching or if you're in a group and you get on those calls every week, that has to be a priority to you. It may feel like work in the beginning, and that's why they call it the work. Yeah. In my experience, the work will become more enjoyable and it'll be something you want to do versus something I have to do. Exactly, exactly. And I, I say to people, just be curious at the beginning. Yeah, follow the curiosity. Have a conversation with yourself. Journaling just changed my life. And that led me to quit drinking. I started journaling in May. I quit drinking in August. Start writing down your thoughts. I know that's scary too. You can write them down and rip it up if you want. But yeah. get it out or talk to somebody that you trust that's not going to judge you. It's not going to tell you anything. But listen and that just relieves so much of the weight that we carry around about this. I would say just is start small and you could go all in on a weekend. You can go all in on one of your favorite days to drink like I did on a Sunday and just see how it plays out. Or you can go all in for yeah. a month or yeah. say, I'm going all in for 2024. Yeah. Be a scientist in your own life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Laurie, how can people contact you? Uh, you can visit my website, lauriemasticott. And you can check out the podcast, 250 and Beyond. That's the best place.